Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Black Hat 2015. A few quick announcements that I'm sure you've heard, but you're going to hear again. There is a reception tonight in the business hall at 5.30 p.m. That room, again, is the Shoreline A room. And then sometime after that, at 6 o'clock in the Mandalay BCD room are the Pony Awards, which, of course, are always a lot of fun. Right now, you're in Jasmine, and you're here to see the targeted takedowns, minimizing collateral damage using passive DNS from Dr. Paul Vixi at Farsight Security. So that's all you need to know right now, other than that this is probably going to be a very interesting talk, and I hope you all enjoy it. And to make sure that we all enjoy it, please also make sure your phones are on silent mode. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Okay, this is working. Good afternoon. Uh, we are, as is the tradition for scheduling of my talks, uh, in a time slot where even I would rather be in the other talk than this one, so thank you for coming. Um, I have talked quite a bit about takedowns. I've talked quite a bit about passive DNS. Uh, we finally realized that there was some applicability in the overlap zone uh, between uh, taking down criminal infrastructure and the use of passive DNS. Um, so we have a uh, fairly lengthy time slot, which means I'm hoping to be interrupted with questions, uh, or we'll save some time at the end. Uh, don't be shy in any case. So I want to briefly go back through what passive DNS is um, and how it is traditionally used, then going to get into some non-traditional uses involving takedowns, um, and then uh, hopefully motivate you to uh, follow up on all of this. Uh, this is me. Um, the most important thing from your point of view is that I started the first anti-spam company and I'm probably the most sued person you will ever meet as a result of that. Um, and uh, moving right along. So, um, in spite of everything that we hear about uh, police brutality or law enforcement overreach and surveillance and the Patriot Act and all the rest of this, the fact is there are a lot of people of good conscience working in law enforcement and in corporate security uh, who really do want to make the world a better place. And they're doing the best they can uh, under our, uh, our system of laws and our system of, of economics. Um, what we have here is a list of all the various ways that people are being hurt by other people online. Um, certainly the uh, online child abuse materials is often considered, it's been called one of the four horsemen of the infopocalypse because it, and it's an argument ender. If you talk about uh, so-called child pornography, uh, there's really no defense against, well, no, the, the people should be able to do whatever they want. Well, no, not in that case. Um, but getting away from that, which I think is uh, almost a corner case, uh, just the center of industry, the center of everything we do in the information age uh, is this network, and we have exposed ourselves to it. Our data, our applications, um, in particular our personal data, our medical data is all now the attack surface. And the stuff that we're building it out of is crap. The technology that we build the information age on is terrible. Um, if you're a programmer, you know that uh, if, what did they say, if uh, uh, builders, if uh, carpenters built buildings the way that programmers build programs, then the first woodpecker to come along would destroy civilization. Um, and that's your supply chain. Um, as we've discovered by looking at all the different libraries and uh, even chips that have various bugs in them, it's impossible to build a secure system. So we're going to be dealing with uh, bad guys getting into our stuff forever. That's, that's the new reality. Uh, we're not going to reach some panacea where the bad guys go away and decide to get real jobs. That's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to keep building cheaper and cheaper electronics and logic and exposing more and more of our uh, data and valuables to it and then we're going to continue having this weird jousting match with the bad guys every year about who's got the better set of techniques. And in the middle of that, we have, as I said, a bunch of people of good conscience working in law enforcement or in corporate security uh, who really just want to make the world safer. 
and they're sympathetic to the idea that they want to make the world safer without extra surveillance, without putting everybody under a spotlight so that if any of them happens to be a criminal, that we'll be able to catch them. Um, so, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to describe here is that uh, this is our life from here on out, and this, this presentation today is about how to live in the middle of that scrum, which will never end. Um, estimating loss is a fool's game, but you have to play it. Uh, this particular estimate, uh, having to do with uh, white-collar crime, was 800 million. Uh, I consider that to be a very low number, even for that year. Uh, but maybe I'm calling other things crime beside that they aren't calling crime. Uh, the, the point is, it's a big number. And what we're doing is we're, essentially, we have a, um, a what is it, the... The, the good guy side of the economy and the bad guy side of the economy. Right? You have a certain number of people in the world who really do want to produce uh, artifacts and systems of value. They want to earn their way. They want to earn their money, and they want it to be that if they do particularly well, it's because they were particularly constructive, creative, and productive. And you have other people who just want to take what they can and live as high off on the hog as they can, and they don't care if ultimately they are parasites on the side of the... Uh, you know, the, the, the productive economy that they're, that they're living in. Um, and you can measure loss, I think, more in the hundreds of billions, not the hundreds of millions, as far as uh, money that is illegally moved from the good guys to the bad guys every year in order to uh, pay for their private yachts and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, the problem, whether it's hundreds of millions or hundreds of billions, the point is it's a big number and it's getting bigger. And you're seeing a lot of law enforcement uh, action. You see uh, certainly the in immigrations and customs people have taken a hand in what are we going to do about all this counterfeit goods. Uh, you saw the SOPA wars. I fought in the SOPA wars. I am one of the reasons we did not get SOPA. I'm not in favor of that approach. Uh, but I don't think we were, uh, that they were wrong to want something. Right? The Internet has certainly hurt the old brick-and-mortar economy. I think we should probably do some something to help with that. SOPA was the wrong thing, though. Um, if we don't help them, that's the kind of solution they're going to come up with. So really, make yourself available to your local congressional staffers, uh, your local FBI field office. Uh, make sure that they have your wisdom as one of their uh, signposts, because, again, they, 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 have, they are of good conscience. They're going to do the best they can to solve these problems. If you don't help them, their solutions are going to be terrible. So um, as you start to fight crime systemically, and you start to look at the structural defects in the economy and in the technology, uh, you begin to notice that, okay, we have this Internet that has this what used to be considered a large pool of IP addresses. We ran out in IPv4. Um, and we have an almost infinite supply of domain names. Now, um, there are other uh, more obscure things like aut autonomous systems, but let's just look at IP addresses and domain names for a moment. Um, they are cooperative. In other words, uh, everybody has to believe the same thing. If, if your company has a certain block of IP address space allocated to it, let's say by Aaron, which is the address allocator here in, in, in the United States, or by RIPE overseas, whatever, uh, or if you have a domain name that's been created for you through maybe GoDaddy and VeriSign if it's .com and so forth, if, you, if you've got some of these identifiers that you're using in your business, the reason that they work is that everyone else respects those allocations toward you. No one else claims, oh, well, I want those addresses or that domain name for myself, so I'm going to use the same one. Uh, the reason that they don't isn't that it couldn't work. Uh, they could make your life a living hell if they tried. Uh, their life would not be great, but your life would be really, really bad if a lot of people conflicted with you and all tried to use the same domain names and the same IP address as you are. So in other words, we're powering this whole economy on cooperation. Um, and... Uh, the bad guys benefit from that because um, you've probably all heard me say that nothing happens on the Internet without DNS. DNS is the first thing that happens for any TCP IP flow. And um, 
that means that whether it's good or bad, the bad guys need good DNS. The good guys need good DNS. Uh, they need you to cooperate with their allocations. They need us, as their victims, to be willing to uh, follow DNS pointers through the name servers and all the rest and you know, drag out the A records and connect to their servers. Uh, they're counting on undifferentiated service. And so one of the things that law enforcement and corporate security very much like to do is to take those identifiers away and to say, if you plan to use a cooperative identifier that only works because I'm cooperating with you, and you're gonna use that in a very unilateral, non-cooperative way, in other words, you're gonna steal stuff from me, then I'm gonna to go to court and I'm gonna take that away from you uh, because you're not using it right. And that works. It doesn't work every time and it's hard and it's taken a long time to build up the case law for it, but it does work. If you take away somebody's domain name and that domain name was their method of stealing from you, for example, the recent Groove Shark uh, uh, case, then uh, you can put a bad guy out of business because their customers won't be able to find them after you have repossessed their domain name. Um, and the same thing can happen with IP addresses or even physical service, servers. If you're uh, interested in putting somebody out of business because they're stealing from you, uh, the courts will help you. The problem is the courts will also believe you. If you say that this service, this server, maybe this ISP, this IP address block, this domain name, is only used by bad guys. The court has no way to know if you knew what you were talking about when you said that. And we've seen some recent examples. Uh, again, Immigrations and Customs would be my, my prime example for this because they took away a domain name um, as part of the Black Ice takedown a couple of years ago that had millions of people in China that also depended on that domain name because it was one of these free, free DNS things. You could get a subdomain for nothing. Uh, and what these guys did is they took the parent domain of something that had millions of subdomains. And they didn't need that. What they needed was about 20 or 30 of the subdomains, but they didn't know that. Um, so the judge said, okay, take it, and they took it. And then people in China were no longer able to send and receive email because their domain names had been seized. Now that created an interesting international incident, and I'm sure that the treaty lawyers are still studying what to do about all that. But my point, the point I'm trying to make today is that that wasn't necessary. Uh, the judge should have been able to call on one of you as an expert witness, and you should have been able to go out and look and say, you know, this is used by an awful lot of people other than the criminals. And we don't think that every user of the asset that, you, that this guy wants to seize is criminal. And you should be able to advise the judge, don't do that. Make them be more specific. It would be like seizing .com because you didn't, didn't like example .com. Um, anyway, oh, sorry about this. I do not know how to shut this up, so we're just going to live with it. Um, so on the internet, everything is connected to everything, and you should always suspect that the thing you're about to seize uh, has dependencies, it has other things depending on it. Uh, and you should uh, say, until I can prove that there aren't a lot of other things depending on this, I'm not gonna ask to seize it, or I'm not going to advise the judge to sign the order that uh, allows it to be seized. Um, so you could see collateral damage of this kind uh, from the shared domain name, I've already mentioned that. Yeah. You, you would not want to seize .com because you hated uh, example.com. Uh, IP address blocks, very similar idea. You might want to uh, cause an ISP to block access to a single host address, but you mistakenly say, I'd like you to block uh, access to a, uh, maybe a class C or class B network, that being 256 adjacent hosts or even 65,000 adjacent hosts. If you don't know what else is there, you don't necessarily know what not to ask for. Uh, but there are other things, deeper. Name server names, turns out, are ex uh, an ex external dependency. If you're taking out some name server that is holding up, let's say, 3,000 domains belonging to a counterfeiter, uh, that might be great because you're taking out a single name server name and you're having this broad impact on the criminal empire that you're up against. But um, 
it's possible that there are a lot of other things that are not the criminals that also need that name server name to keep working, or domain names completely unrelated to your cause of action are also going to stop working. So, um, I'm, I'm not going to go through every one of these details. These slides will be on the CD-ROM or on the website. Um, but let's just say uh, we've had a bunch of high-profile times when some company or some law enforcement agency had their name in the paper the next day because they did not do enough homework before they got their court order. And remember, judges tend to be uh, older folks. Right? In my generation, uh, they, they're the, the guys who don't know how to set the time on their VCRs. In this generation, they're the people who probably could not reinstall Windows on their laptop if they had to. So they, are, they, they tend to believe what you tell them. And it's important that you tell them something as specific as possible when you're doing one of these takedowns. Um, so you can't say that any collateral damage at all is too much. Uh, sadly, uh, we, we had, there's an acceptable limit, and there, you, you have to say, you know, I did the best I could, but in order to get this bad guy to stop doing the bad thing to me, I had to take out a resource that did have some external dependencies on it. Yeah. Um, and I made it as specific as I could, but I was not willing to walk away and do nothing because there were going to be innocent victims here. Um, so if, if I seem like I'm, I'm calling for a zero threshold, uh, please let me disabuse you. So again, this, the slides are available, um, so I'm not going to read through this whole thing. Uh, I just want to say that the things you have to check for in, are all over the damn place. Like URL shortener sites, for example. Uh, we, we've seen court orders requesting that bit.ly be repossessed because some criminal was using a bunch of uh, URL shorteners. And you know, that when I was asked about that, I said, no, <laughs> you're going to have to find some other thing that this criminal is depending on that is not bit.ly. Um, Anyways, a long list, and this is in fact a, a partial list. This is what would fit on one slide in a, in a types, uh, typeface I thought you could read from your seats. Uh, we could go on for a long time on that. Um, so let's look at some of the, the major ones. You wouldn't want to black hole a root name server. You know, yes, a root name server is necessary for all criminal action, but that's also, it's also necessary for just about everything else. So you, that, that would be an example of something you'd want to stay away from. Also, the name server is responsible for any of the TLDs, right? Any of VeriSign's servers for .com, don't block those, because you will hurt yourself way more than you will hurt VeriSign. Um, but interestingly, there is now something called a public suffix list, and this is used often in browsers to figure out what the same origin cookie policy ought to be, um, which I think is just insane, but they're doing it. Um, and this is where you have names like co.uk, which is the uh, version, it's .com for the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, it's not a TLD, but it acts like a TLD. In other words, any direct child of co.uk is a delegation point. It is, it is a point where there's a registry above that part of the namespace, and there is some registrant like us below that part. So any time you have a delegation point, uh, the, the parent is something you should protect. And that's why uh, the free DNS providers that black eyes blacked by mistake would be an example of something to leave alone. If somebody's giving away third level domains under you know, noip.com or something like that, uh, you would like it to be that noip.com is safe and none of its assets will be seized. Because you know, yes, they're necessary for crime, but they're necessary for so much more. You just have to be a little more specific than that. But anyway, these are some examples of, of things that you should uh, have at top of mind when doing this type of, res of research. Um, and you know, there are a lot of registries, registrars. Uh, certainly, I've seen it happen that people blocked the Google website because they thought they were uh, being uh, spammed, and it was actually the robots doing the indexing. So, you know, you, uh, that level of care, I think I don't need to tell you in this audience to do. Um, but here's an interesting one, crypto infrastructure. It turns out that to make this whole piece of junk called X509 certificate authorities work, you have to have an online revocation 
provider. You have to have the ability when you are trying to validate the key that some web server just gave you, or the signature rather, and the key, uh, that you have the, also the ability to ask some third party, has this been revoked? Because if it has been revoked, chances are the web server is not going to tell you it's been revoked because they are a criminal and they want you to accept the certificate. So there's this look aside thing that happens asynchronously when you're visiting an HTTPS website or doing any other SSL type activity that requires you to be able to reach these certificate revocation services. Um, so anything that prevents those names from validating uh, in, in DNS, anything that prevents you from reaching the name server, anything that uh, prevents you from being able to get a signed crypto authentic indication from that service that there is no revocation for the thing you're asking about is going to slow down everything you do. 30 to 60 seconds per web click is what you should expect to be penalized by if you were to firewall these things out. So I mentioned this before, but I want to just say uh, bad guys are not as dumb as they used to be. I wish they were, but we keep training them and then they keep getting better. Um, and so they know that we want to avoid unpleasant side effects for ourselves. They know that collateral damage that puts our company's name or perhaps our law enforcement office's name in the newspapers tomorrow because we did a takedown that had a lot of collateral damage, is that's something we'd like to avoid. And so they do pretty much what the Germans did in Dresden, is uh, they put their stuff right next to a bunch of stuff that we don't want to hurt. Um, and you have to be prepared for that. They're going to do this on purpose. They're going to find shared resources that you will be afraid to touch. And um, that means you have to be more clever than they are and find things they're sharing that they didn't even know they were sharing, or you have to be willing to tolerate the occasional time when your company name is in the newspapers because that was the best choice open to you. Now, ISPs have asked me, ever since I started the first anti-spam company, uh, what if I only have a few bad actors? You know, are you still going to hurt me? Uh, and the answer is, that depends. If you have a record of doing the best you can to keep the bad guys out, in other words, your salespeople are not signing so-called pink contracts with people that you know are only going to use your service to annoy other people or spam them or or whatever. Uh, you're, you're not looking for bad business, and when you do find them, you raise the, the fire under those customers and try to get rid of them, and you're trying to run a clean shop, then you're going to get the close ones. And if, 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 if you're doing the best you can do, you're proactive, you have an abuse desk, you're willing to spend some money on keeping abuse out of your network, and you're willing to lose some money when those customers go away, chances are you're not going to get, uh, you're, you will not face massive takedown. But certainly uh, all of you read the Krebs articles about EST domains and uh, the provider in San Francisco that got de-peered, went out of business and had its assets sold for scrap to the FBI as it turns out. Um, it was all about a company who was showing absolutely no sympathy for victims and was showing a lot of sympathy for criminals. So really, uh, if, you, if you want to get the close ones, you have to behave as well as you can the rest of the time. Um, that's like real life, just real life intruding on the internet again. Um, you can also do yourself a huge favor as an ISP if you use uh, our Who Is or SWIP or whatever it takes so that you, the customer allocations of IP address blocks out of your larger block, you know, if you're giving a smaller block to some customer somewhere, there's a way to tell Aaron or Ripe or Afrinic, you can tell your RIR that this has been done, which means that when somebody has been victimized by one of your customers and they do a who is, they will end up seeing your customer's name in that who is result instead of your ISP's name in that result. Um, so really, anything you can do to offer recourse and accountability to victims will, make, will improve your chances of not being thought to be in cahoots with those criminals when, uh, uh, when, when the bullets are flying. All right. Passive DNS, um, briefly, I wish I had a diagram instead of this page. Um, Passive DNS is a way to collect transactions that are occurring in the domain name system uh, between servers. So 
Uh, there's a bunch of recursive name servers that are being operated for us here by the Black Hat NOC, uh, and who knows, they're running Unbound or Bind or you know, whatever they're running, doesn't matter. Uh, they're speaking a protocol that is causing our laptops and smartphones to be able to surf and reach things, because we're sending simple queries, we're getting back uh, simple responses. Behind that server, the recursive, upstream of that recursive server, there's quite a bit more going on. It's not just a simple one answer, or excuse me, one question, one answer. Because uh, you may have to play Go Fish. You might, you know, let's see, if you're looking for www.example.com and you're, you're, you know nothing, you're going have to have to ask the root servers, where is com? You're going have to have to ask the com servers, where is example.com? And finally, you can ask the example.com servers, where is www? Um, but those back-end transactions are the heart of passive DNS. Um, and certainly, there's different ways to do this. Uh, my company happens to be in the passive DNS business, but we're not the only ones. So this is not a product pitch, except to say that uh, there's a way to do this that is quite compatible with the internet neo-libertarian philosophy of no surveillance. And that is to say, if you only gather upstream transactions that are server-to-server, -server, sort of back-office transactions, you will have no subscriber IP addresses, and you won't see any reuse events, so you see no cache hits. So you don't know what was popular, and you don't know who looked it up. And to me, that makes it pretty, uh, pretty passable. I'm, I'm willing to live with this level of privacy intrusion. Uh, because there's no way to use our system, for example, to do surveillance. You, you, you can't start an investigation using only server-to-server -server traffic. You might be able to enhance one, but you could never discover that a crime had taken place uh, or get a suspect by looking at the data we collect. Uh, in any case, what you do with these observations is put them into a database and you index them. Um, and if you do this long enough and you have enough servers, you will end up with a database that pretty accurately reflects the actual content of the entire DNS, rather than just the part of DNS that you yourself on your smartphone or laptop happen to have looked, looked up. Uh, so in my company, we've been saving 200,000 events per second for about five years, and we have, I think, a very rich content source there. And what you get to do with this, uh, after you index it, is to discover relationships. Um, and it's usually used defensively, where you might say, I've been uh, spammed, there was a phishing link in the spam, it had a domain name in the middle of that phishing link, the domain has been taken down because some security company got it taken down, you know, yay them, but now that means I can't see it. Um, but I can ask the passive DNS system what the result was during the time before it was taken down. And if it was, uh, let's say, moved around a few times, you'll see the history. You'll see all the different values that that domain has ever resolved to. And you can find out what name servers have served it. And you can find out what other domain names were served by the same name servers. You can then find out what other name servers have similar IP addresses to those name servers, and what is the list of domain names served by those name servers. In other words, starting with one tiny piece of information from your attacker that they had to expose in order to attack you, you might have a good chance of mapping their whole infrastructure to better target your uh, criminal law, uh, complaint or civil lawsuits. Um, and that's the normal defensive use. And uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's why Passive DNS was created, in fact, was to facilitate that use. I, I can say that because I know the guy who invented it, Florian Weimar. Um, but it turns out that it has another use re related to takedown, which is why I'm here today. Um, certainly one of the things you have to do, um, this is one of, my, one of my researchers really wants me to make this point, um, sometimes IP addresses get reused by different people, and if it's been sitting on the shelf for six months, you don't necessarily want your investigation to traipse into the previous echelon of use. So you do do, do some time fencing on your lookups when you're trying to do the defensive application I just said. You know, don't find out that some name server has been responsible for two million domains, but that was all three years ago, uh, for example. Um, and I do want to emphasize, this is important, uh, this is, passive DNS is not a reputation source. Uh, I started the first anti-spam company. We invented the thing now called the RBL, 
I'm very proud of it, lawsuits and all, uh, but that is different than this. Those are uh, judgment calls, those are opinions, those are statements of danger versus uh, safety. And uh, this is not a reputation system. If somebody has a passive DNS database and offers you access to it, take it. But realize that what you're seeing is facts that were observed and that it's up to you to draw conclusions about whether they were good or evil. Um, and certainly Spam House and Serbal are two extremely uh, effective reputation systems. If you're not using them, you should. And uh, there's a, a way of an, making an inquiry of both at once using the URL shown here. Um, but anyway, with that background, let's take a look at a, an actual use case of uh, what you might do if you don't, it's not a defensive use, it's a takedown related use. Uh, if you are starting with this domain name, uh, where the, the final period has been changed into brackets DOT in order to prevent you from cutting and pasting this and actually running the query, um, if you have seen it, um, and you're wondering, should I take it down? Should I block it? Or should I maybe ask the registry to delete? I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but uh, should I ask the Germans uh, to delete this thing ending in 24 here? Uh, you'd like to know who else is depending on it besides the criminal who, who just attacked you. Um, so the current result, as of the day we made these slides, uh, was that it had two IP addresses. Uh, and we found that both of those were listed on the Spam House SBL, uh, usually an indication that they really are uh, dark-hearted folk. Um, but let's look at what else we can learn. Um, here we are looking at um, what are the other names that point to the same IP address. And it turned out that there were some things that look a little bit like name server names. Um, and that is an indication that there's trouble ahead because you need to find out what name server or what domains depend on that name server because if you take away this name, you'll be taking away all of the infrastructure that supports those other names. Uh, the other one's very similar, um, DNS2 instead of DNS1. Um, but is this something that's only been true for the last week? I mean, how, how long has this person been at that ISP? How long has this, thing, this particular domain name been served where it is? So this is uh, looking at the history. Uh, didn't have a huge count. It wasn't terribly popular during all the times that it spent one day or one week at, uh, or maybe two weeks at some provider, but it has moved around quite a bit. Now, if it's moving around quite a bit and it's listed on Serbal, that's, uh, that's two strikes because moving around is called fast flux or can be. You can have legitimate reasons for moving around, like, for example, you're akamized and you've got a CDN backing you. Uh, but if you don't have a legitimate reason, chances are you're moving around because you're getting kicked off. Uh, so moving around and being listed on Serbal are uh, two strikes against you in terms of analyzing for your own reasons, uh, what is the reputation of, of this, this name. Um, now here, we're looking for all the subdomains. This is a particularly powerful query for passive DNS because it's something that normal DNS can't even conceive of, is you know, show me all the names that are children of that name. Um, but we didn't see a whole lot of other unique names. In other words, we don't have a huge uh, slush pile now of other names that we have to check the dependencies on. The ones that we found were pretty much the ones we already had. Um, but name server names look like name server names. If you see DNS1 and DNS2, you know those are name server names, and so you really kind of want to know uh, what else depends on that. Um, so here's a query where uh, there's quite a few things depend on it. 130,000 things depend on it. That's usually an indication of a parking domain service. Um, and you know, these are some examples. Yandex, Roos, security, stop, dot, ru. You know, I'm not enough of a Russian to be able to tell you if that's likely to be a, a company name or, or you know, uh, some kind of a phishing domain. Um, but the fact that there are 130,000 of them gives us some pause. We look, this is looking at the same thing for NS2, which has pretty much the same name. So everything that is served by one is mostly served by the other. Uh, and yet, that first one, starting with G-E-S-U-N, is listed on the Spam House DBL and Serbal. Now, I, I, 
it looks like all three of these were. Uh, now, for 130,000 of them, we might not be willing to check every domain name to see if it's blocked in Serbal, but for at least a handful, you should take a look, because if everyone you look at, of the first 10 out of that 130,000 are in Serbal, eh, it's probably a name server that the world could, could, uh, would be a better place without. Um, now, we did run into one other name server looking name during those previous searches, and um, we found a very low count. And we didn't find a very long period of time um, for the first one. Yeah, the, so with the counts this low, you know that there aren't enough things looking this up for this to be all that important. So, you know, the, at this point you're in the investigation, you're leaning in the direction of blocking this thing, and this doesn't convince you to change your mind. Um, but that's really what you should do. That level of understanding of the infrastructure you intend to block before you then reach out to the Germans and say, could you please block this second level name ending in .de. Um, and the alternative, which has been tried by a number of different uh, high profile takedowns, is where you just kind of uh, wing it and you just hope for the best. And then your name is in the papers tomorrow and then your chief counsel is answering questions from your chief executive and chief executive is answering questions from the board uh, who might be answering questions from the SEC. So you really want to use your powers wisely and if this level of homework is not, uh, as you've just seen, it's not an insuperable burden, it's not an unreasonable ask, you know, to just do this level of checking before you ask that judge to take away that domain name, then yeah, don't just wing it. So, um, some of you are wondering why you're sitting here, uh, those of you who haven't already left, because you're not in the business of taking things down, you're not a uh, corporate security type, you're not law enforcement, you're not likely to be called as an expert witness by a judge asking you, is this a reasonable request? Uh, there are some other things that may apply to you, which is that, let's imagine you're about to purchase some infrastructure. Maybe it's a managed name service or uh, VPN, VPS, uh, whatever it is, there's some vendor somewhere of some service who's answering a request for proposal uh, or a request for quotation and you're wondering, all right, so what kind of a neighborhood are you in? What, who are your other customers and are they also, uh, are they like me or are they a bunch of really dark-hearted folks and I'm going to face uh, a lot of overbroad takedowns because I'm your customer, just because of who your other customers are. Um, uh, we've had a number of people use our passive DNS service to, to locate that. Just say, all right, this ISP has, you know, maybe 2,048 adjacent IP addresses. Let's look at the history of all the names that have ever pointed at any address in that address block. And if what you see is a whole bunch of things that look like online child abuse materials or um, you know, uh, massage services or, or whatever it is that you don't want to be associated with, you might use that as a uh, decision criteria for maybe I'm going to pay extra to get a provider that is not this, this one. The lowest bidder might not be to your liking. Um, and you can do the same thing with any other infrastructure that you intend to purchase, whether it's managed name service, managed mail service, whatever. Find out who their other customers are. It's public information. You're not doing any, you know, violating anybody's privacy by doing this. Um, and, you know, again, I, I can't stress enough that if you are uh, a service provider and you're doing the best you can, then everybody, including Spam House and Serbal, is going to be on your side and you're not going to face blocking. But if there are some trivial steps that you could be taking to keep criminals from uh, enabling or from uh, using your service as a foundation and you're not taking those, those trivial steps, then uh, pretty much people are going to be looking for an excuse to cut you off. So nothing is too big to take down. Um, I, I realize that uh, most of you are sane and so you have probably never blocked gmail.com, but I did for the first two years. It wasn't until members of my family started getting uh, accounts in Gmail and could not send me uh, email that I was willing to accept email from them. 
But what I discovered is that in those two years, Google bought an anti-spam company and actually paid some attention, did some machine learning, and so now Gmail is not a spam source. Uh, but there was a time when Gmail was pure spam, and I rejected all mail from them. Um, and I think you'll discover that nobody, not even Google, not even Akamai, is so big that you would not block them if they start demonstrating bad patterns of behavior, you know, antisocial in a way that shifts their costs to you or uh, profits at your expense. Uh, finally, I always say this, and I'm down to my last five minutes, um, we need your data, not just we, Farsight, but any passive DNS uh, project, whether for-profit or non-profit, and I don't know which we are, uh, needs more data. Because the more we can see, then the more the customers can see. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of, we, we ourselves give away free accounts to law enforcement and academics, and we're not alone. Most passive DNS projects do that. And so anything you can do to contribute this data that has no PIIs, no, no privacy implication in this data, uh, would really help the world. It'll give you a better world to operate in, and it'll cost you nothing. Uh, so, you know, please think about that. If you're running a recursive name server and you're technically able to run a sensor, uh, Google will tell you who you could contact or you can reach out to me. Um, we don't collect PII. I've already stressed that. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. So we have... Uh, Five minutes for questions. I think that shows that what we've been doing, not just us, but the other passive DNS uh, providers in the, in the world, uh, has worked. And it has caused the bad guys to have to think about new ways to operate. And, you know, I don't think it's news to anybody in this room that there's no such thing as a silver bullet and that no matter what we do, it will be countered. It's a question of how much cost there will be for the bad guys to counter it and how long it will take them. But those are the only variables. We know they will do it. So I think that's what you're seeing there, is they, they believe that Twitter is too, too large to block, and probably it is. But um, the more they leverage that, then the more the machine learning geeks at Twitter themselves are going to be looking for that stuff. And you know, So I, I think that to the extent that we, we can force the bad guys to make a move, and we can cause them to maybe go, in a, go into some set of infrastructure that is not their preferred infrastructure, that we might make the next move easier on ourselves. Uh, obviously, you got to play. This is like chess. You got to play three or four moves ahead if you want to win. Yeah. So in our first version of this, which some of you know, I started inside of Internet Systems Consortium, which was my nonprofit. Um, and by the way, we bought the assets fair and square and we overpaid for them. So this was not a, a case where public infrastructure became private infrastructure. Um, but when we first started this at, in 2007, I was collecting data from not just uh, recursive servers, but also authority servers. Because ultimately it's two ends of the same transaction. When, an, when a recursive server is asking a question, it's asking an authority that question. So, in other words, seeing the question and answer come in to a, an authority is almost as good as seeing it, you know, as it leaves the recursive at the far end. Um, but I say, I say almost as good. And it turns out, really, it isn't as good. Because um, <clears throat> what we found is that uh, there's a fairly small working set of popular names that an authority is going to answer. And... Um, you're going to get all of those at least, oh, let's say 500,000 times per TTL. Um, so the data that we get from authority servers is extraordinarily self-similar. And uh, once we run it through the deduplicator, it crushes out to such a small sliver of data that I'd kind of rather see the data at the recursive end of that transaction. So even though it's the same transaction, 
There just isn't enough namesplay at, a, at an authority, unless it's a parking server that is serving millions of authority zones. Yeah. So the question is, uh, you know, 200,000 events per second sounds like it might be expensive to collect and so forth. It is. That was one of the reasons I pulled this out of the nonprofit is that we didn't have access to capital and we were constrained about how big we could get. Um, but it turns out that if you're really clever, and certainly the people working for my company are, even if I am not, uh, you can do everything you need to do in RAM. Um, so the, you know, other than the five-year storage, where we obviously that's in SSD, uh, but all of the deduplication and all of the early uh, filter, filtering out of DNS tunnels and uh, DNS cache pollution attempts and everything else that really isn't DNS, that all happens in RAM, and so pretty much uh, takes about a half a rack of equipment that costs ooh, maybe 80 grand. To, uh, to do this job at the hub. Um, at the far end, where the sensor is, uh, it's de minimis, it's, it's negligible. Because uh, what you're doing, if, if you install our sensor, what it is is a C program that links against uh, libpcap. So it's just like the TCP dump command, except it runs as a daemon. And it just sits there watching for request packets to go one way and keeping a little bit of state around so that it knows what requests are outstanding, waits for the fragmented response to come back, reassembles the fragments, and then puts that together and sends it upstream. Most recursive servers are in the uh, 20 to 1 or uh, between 20 and 50 to 1 uh, reduction due to DNS caching. In other words, if you're answering uh, 20 million queries, you are only going to be sending 1 million cache misses upstream while doing it. And uh, the provisioning problem that recursive name server operators think they have is the number of queries per second and especially the bandwidth toward the stubs, in other words, towards the smartphones and the servers and all the rest. Uh, so the cache miss traffic is such a small thing that they mostly don't even account for it. And since our traffic requirement mirrors something that they already don't care about, that basically you install this thing, it runs in one corner of your CPU, it takes about, you know, worst case, I've, uh, I've seen it take about 1 20th of the, the CPU cycles that the name server itself is taking. So really the sensor has such a light footprint that no one notices it. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all.